Center as well. On Monday night, I hope you can join us at the Embassy of Germany uh, for a reception and a talk with the ambassador be talking to us, among other things, about the German celebrations right now of the fall of the wall, the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, and also about uh, NATO and uh, Afghanistan and a few other issues of American German interest these days. <coughs> Um, and then in uh, two weeks' time, on the 19th of October, we will host uh, Marshall Goldman, who will talk about his book, Petro State, Putin, Power, and the New Russia. Both very interesting events. This evening, it's our pleasure to host David Bosco, who has written Five to Rule Them All, the UN Security Council and the Making of the Modern World. He is a contributing editor or contributing writer at Foreign Policy Magazine and assistant professor at American University School of International Service. He was senior editor at Foreign Policy between 2004 and 2006, and previously he was an attorney at the law firm of Cleary Gottlieb Steen and Hamilton. He served as a political analyst and journalist in Bosnia and as a deputy director of the Joint United Nations NATO Project on Refugee Repatriation in Sarajevo. A former Fulbright scholar, he received his law degree from Harvard Law School and a master's degree in international relations from Cambridge University. We're delighted to have him here with us this evening to tell us about his latest work. Thanks, um, well, thank you very much to the World Affairs Council um, for hosting this event in this uh, fantastic venue, which I just think is, is uh, wonderful. Um, maybe I can uh, start um, just by telling you a little bit about how I became interested enough in the Security Council um, to want to spend the last three years um, working on a book about it. Um, my background is, in essence, both as a lawyer and as a journalist. Um, and I think those two sides of um, my background kind of combined to, to get me interested in writing a um, historical account of the Security Council. Um, as a lawyer, you look at the Security Council. Do we have lawyers here? Just so I'm, okay. I figured that would be the case. Um, as a lawyer, you read the United Nations Charter, um, you think about international law, and you look at the Security Council, and you realize this is an institution that has enormous power. Um, you know, just looking at the United Nations Charter, any country that signs on to the UN Charter, and that is, in essence, every country in the world, um, has delegated to the Security Council the right to enforce peace and security. They have said that you represent us um, when you handle issues of peace and security. And, you know, coming from a background of international relations as the venue of sovereign states, where every state has, um, you know, the right to control their foreign affairs, the notion that by signing on to the Security Council, you've given, by signing on to the UN Charter, you've given this very small elite Security Council the right to manage peace and security and the right to act on your behalf is quite a striking thing. And it becomes even more striking when you consider the powers that the Council has. Um, the Council has the power to impose sanctions, to enforce blockades, to use force. Um, I mean, in essence, the Security Council can do what it wants in the name, all in the name of the international community. It can claim to be doing that all on behalf of the international community. So, you take that enormous power, um, and then you say, well, what, what checks are there on that power? Um, from a formal legal sense. And you look around the international community and you try to say, okay, what institutions could provide a check and balance against the Security Council? And you think, well, you might think the International Court of Justice. That is the kind of leading court in the international system. Um, perhaps they could exercise judicial review over the Security Council. So if the Security Council goes too far, um, if it takes its, you know, if it if it takes its powers too much to heart and decides to kind of go haywire, maybe somebody in the international community can step in and say the Security Council has gone too far. But if you look at what the International Court of Justice has done, there are actually a few countries who have tried to challenge Security Council decisions and tried to say what the Security Council is doing here is illegal. Um, and, and the International Court of Justice wants nothing to do with it. 
they never have tried to impose judicial review on the Security Council. And you say, well, maybe the General Assembly of the UN can somehow rein in the Security Council. But they don't have that power under the UN Charter. They can't do that. Their resolutions are non-binding. So there's really no formal check in the international system on the Security Council's powers. Um, it is a remarkable diplomatic creation. Um, and so that was the lawyer side of me that said, wow, this is a, a fantastically powerful body, um, at least in terms of its formal legal powers. Um, the journalist side of me said, I'd like to tell the story of this body, of this diplomatic creation. Um, there's, as many of you in the room will know, there's a fantastic amount of kind of specialist literature on the Security Council. You can find dozens and dozens of law, reviews, law review articles every year on the Council. Um, but there hadn't been much in the way of a historical account of the, the body. Some, you know, an, an account that you would want to pick up and read that would tell you this is what the Security Council has done throughout its history. Um, and I just thought from a journalistic standpoint, the fact that you basically picked up the world's great powers, put them in a room together and said, manage peace and security, um, was a kind of fascinating story. And I wanted to know what had gone on behind the scenes. What, uh, what the Security Council's deliberations have been like, and that's the story that I try to tell in this book. It's essentially a historical narrative um, of the Security Council. Now, I, I might just kind of dip in um, to that history, right, and, and I'm not going to kind of run through the whole history for you, but I thought I might kind of dip into the history just to talk a little bit about the beginnings of the Security Council and how it was formed because it was not very far from here that the Security Council, in essence, took shape. Um, that was at the Dumbarton Oaks Conference um, in Georgetown in the closing days of World War II, when the big three powers, the, the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union, came together and decided, um, in essence, you know, they, they created the shape of what would become the United Nations. Now, it wasn't formally created then, it was formally created during the San Francisco Conference, of course. Um, but the, 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 the basic structure of the United Nations was created, uh, was agreed to at the Dumbarton Oaks Conference. And I thought I might just tell quickly the story of how the big three, because it was only the United States, the so uh, Soviet Union, and the UK that really engaged in the Dumbarton Oaks talks. How did the big three become the permanent five? Um, because it is the permanent five members of the Security Council that this book focuses on. Um, that, thus the title, Five to Rule Them All, which was inspired, of course, by the Lord of the Rings. Um, <laughs> but the five to rule them all. So how did the big three become the permanent five? Well, so you have the, uh, the, the big three delegations at Dumbarton Oaks, and there are, um, <coughs> the Soviets, I think, would prefer that the Security Council remain the big three. The Soviets, to Stalin, Stalin's mind was, was extremely pragmatic about what the United Nations could be. His view was this is a mechanism for continuing the wartime alliance. Um, I don't want it to be much more than that. I would like it to be a continuation of the wartime alliance. Um, I think he was skeptical, the Soviets were skeptical about adding other powers onto what would become the Security Council. But he ran into some very determined advocacy on the part of Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt. Winston Churchill insisted that the French be on the council. Um, and you might say, why would the British insist that France be on the Security Council? And I think the, the, the thinking in Britain was, once the war ends, we are going to be exhausted, broke, um, not able to maintain an army on, on the, the main, you know, on, on in the European mainland, so to speak, um, we need another big power there between us and the Soviets. We need another big power there to help keep in check the Soviets, to help make sure the Germans don't come back. Um, and France seemed to be that big power. That, and so it was, in, it was in the British national interest, um, and Churchill very much saw this, to resuscitate France as a great power. And so the British insisted at Dumbarton Oaks that France be included as one of the permanent five members of the Security Council. Now, Stalin uh, thought this was absurd. You know, that, that France had been clearly destroyed as a great power, had been, you know, defeated and occupied by the Germans. Um, the French, he said, after World War II, would be charming but weak. Um, and so why would you want to put them on this new Security Council? I'm not sure who was right about them being charming 
Um, but anyway. Um, so Fran the British insisted, and they got their way, um, that, that uh, France would be on the Security Council. They basically agreed at Dumbarton Oaks, uh, OK, we'll reserve a place for France. Formally, the offer won't be extended in, to them until they have a new government, because it was actually during the Dumbarton Oaks conference that France was liberated. So it was only as the conference took place that it was being liberated from, uh, from Nazi Germany. Now, the other member of the Security Council then, China. How did China become a permanent member? Here, um, you look to Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, the United States, during World War II, treated, consistently treated China as a great power. Um, and that had both kind of sentimental, I would say, but also strategic considerations. Um, nationalist China was an ally in the fight against Japan. The United States wanted to kind of elevate their status. Um, and the United States had become kind of attached to the idea of creating China as a great power, which is kind of interesting in light of you know, where we stand today. Um, and so Roosevelt, much to the consternation of the Soviets and the British, said China must be on the Security Council. Um, and in fact, they went so far as to insist that the Dumbarton Oaks talks actually have two different stages. The first stage, where everything was more or less agreed to, was between the US, the Soviets, and the British. And then there was a second kind of Potemkin conference where the Chinese were brought in. Uh, the Soviets left and the Chinese were brought in to kind of have another conference um, where the poor Chinese delegation, I mean, everything had essentially been decided, but the Roosevelt felt that it was important to include the Chinese in the Dunbar Notice talks. Um, so Roosevelt gets his way, China is included, and so that is how the big three became the permanent five that we know today, and that the permanent five that still dominate. Um, the Security Council in many ways. There is, I think, kind of a, a historical footnote, which is interesting. Roosevelt wanted another country to be on the Security Council as a permanent member. Does anyone have a, have a guess as to Roosevelt's other candidate for Security Council membership? Turkey. Sorry? Turkey. No. No. The Italy. Oh, Italy. Italy wishes. Um, <laughs> Brazil. Brazil. Roosevelt insisted that, uh, tried to insist that Brazil be a member. He thought there should be a member from Latin America. Um, but this was really a step too far for Churchill and Stalin. Um, because they thought China's already going to be a vote, basically, for the United States, nationalist China. Um, having Brazil on there, they're going to be an American ally. That'll be essentially three votes um, for the United States, and so we can't stand for that. So Brazil almost had, you know, a permanent seat on the Security Council. Um, okay, so that's the beginning. So that's how the big three became the permanent five. Um, very rapidly, once the Security Council begins its operations, and its first meeting is in January of 1946, actually in London. Um, this was before they had, they had formally decided to move the UN to New York. Um, and it's very apparent at the first meetings of the Security Council that the Cold War, the emerging Cold War, is going to dominate its proceedings. Um, and you start to have, um, at, these, at these very early meetings, something, you know, a, a kind of strain that we see throughout the Security Council's history, which is the Security Council as public political theater. Um, you, you see during the Council's very early weeks of operation, very loud and heated arguments between the representatives of the Soviet Union in particular, and the ambassadors of the United States and Britain on the other, on the other side. Um, at one point during one of these early meetings, there was almost a fist fight between the British foreign minister and the Soviet foreign minister. So this, this, this practice of Security Council meetings becoming, in essence, public fights between the big powers, public battles, rhetorical battles between the big powers is very much set in the early weeks of the Security Council's operations. And you have Soviet, the Soviet use of the veto power. Um, veto power had been decided on. Everyone was kind of shocked. Soviets decided to use it freely, um, and in the first you know couple months of the Security Council's operations, they used the veto um, a number of times. They walked out of meetings, um, you know, as a dramatic show of protest at the, at the decisions that the Security Council was trying to take. And so this public theater element then recurs quite a bit um, during the during the Cold War. Uh, the Korean War debates uh, were a notable example of that. Some of you may know um, that it was only by historical accident that the Security Council was actually able to take action during the Korean War. It was because the Soviets had already walked out of the Security Council 
that the United States was able to push through resolutions that it wanted. But once those resolutions were passed, and believe me, the Soviets never walked out again after that. And they, just, they learned their lesson. Um, but after that, um, the Soviets decided kind of in the midst of the fighting in Korea to return to the Security Council. And in August 1950, and there was a, a, a series of very public clashes then between the, the Soviet ambassador who kind of played the, you know, he was, he was the perfect kind of communist ambassador. His name was Yakov Malik. Um, and there were these public clashes between him and the Western members of the Security Council that were all televised live. That was one of the remarkable things about many of these early Security Council meetings. When I say this was public political theater, it really was. It was televised live, it was reported on widely. You know, if you go back and look at the New York Times, you know, front page coverage constantly about what happened at the Security Council meeting, the, the kind of um, rhetoric that was used by one side against the other side. Um, and the United States had some very effective practitioners of public diplomacy at the Security Council. Henry Cabot Lodge was uh, a U.S. ambassador for a number of years on the Security Council. And one of the stories that I tell in the book is how um, during the U-2 incident, um, when a, an American spy plane was shot down in 1960 over the Soviet Union, the Soviets decided that they would make political hay of this at the Security Council. And they called a Security Council meeting, you know, in high dudgeon, they denounced the United States um, for its reckless activity in flying spy planes over the Soviet Union. And I think the Soviets thought that they were going to win a major propaganda victory. But they didn't count on Henry Cabot Lodge's penchant for theatrics. He brought to a public Security Council meeting a huge kind of great seal of the United States, one of these wooden great seals of the United States, which had actually been presented to the United States Embassy in Moscow by the Soviets as a gesture of friendship. And Lodge you know, brought this out and he held it up at the, the Security Council table and he proceeds to show how the Soviets had embedded deep in the wood of the great, this great seal an electronic bug. Um, and so you know, his point was, he, the Soviets spy as well. We all spy. Um, and so, you know, get off your, your moral high horse about this. Um, and he was quite effective, I think. Henry Cabot Lodge was a very effective U.S. ambassador in terms of the public theatrics of the Security Council. I think the kind of most iconic moment in terms of um, the Security Council as public political theater was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, the, the kind of very famous um, Adlai Stevenson confrontation with uh, the Soviet ambassador Zorin, where um, during which Stevenson basically confronts Zorin directly, says, "Do you or do you not have missiles in Cuba? Don't wait for the translator." Um, Zorin says, "You'll get your answer in due time." Stevenson says, "I'm prepared to wait here until hell freezes over for my answer." Um, now, fantastic moment from. Um, the perspective of public diplomacy, it went over very well with the, in the, with the U.S. public and with uh, some U.S. allies. One of the, I, I tell in the, in the book the kind of backstory of the Adlai Stevenson moment during the Security Council. Adlai Stevenson had to be convinced by the Kennedy administration um, to make the case to the Security Council. He was very skeptical initially, and he, he, was good, he had good reason to be uh, for his skepticism. He had, several months earlier, been humiliated during the Bay of Pigs episode when he had um, been provided by the CIA with photographs that purported to show that the United States was not involved in the Bay of Pigs invasion. They were photographs of the planes that were involved in, in some of the airstrikes during the Bay of Pigs operation. And the photograph showed, said the CIA, that these were Cuban that these were Cuban defectors who had taken their Cuban planes and turned them against the Castro regime. Well, of course, a couple days later it came out that the United States was deeply involved and Stevenson almost resigned, actually, from his post as UN ambassador. So humiliated was he by having kind of misled the UN. So he was a, initially he was a quite reluctant gladiator um, when it came to you know, making the US case before the Security Council. He became convinced, though, in the kind of week or ten days leading up to that famous confrontation. Um, and there's actually an amusing um, kind of back and forth. The White House, um, and this is a dynamic that appears often in Security Council history, uh, particularly as regards American diplomacy, 
the White House wanted to be intricately involved in crafting Stevenson's speech to the Security Council, and they kept editing it from Washington. Um, they would, you know, no, take out this paragraph, put in this paragraph. And Stevenson was, you know, you know, he'd been up all night preparing the speech. He was exhausted. He was frustrated. He said, "Damn it, I'm going to the Security Council. You know, the meeting's in ten minutes. I'm walking to the Security Council." His staff is racing behind him, telling him, "President Kennedy's on the line. He needs to talk to you." Stevenson says, no, I'm going, the meeting is about to start. Um, it's only on the um, outside the Security Council chamber that Stevenson's aides prevail on him to take the phone call from, from President Kennedy. And President Kennedy tells him to kind of tone down the speech, actually. That was one of the ironies of this moment, um, is that Kennedy wanted Stevenson to kind of tone it down. And it was only during a pause in the Security Council meeting that the word came from the White House, OK, you can now really go after Soren. And so Stevenson does with the famous result of this confrontation. So um, kind of an interesting um, behind the scenes moments in terms of uh, the use of the Security Council as uh, a forum for public diplomacy. Now, that Adlai Stevenson moment, though, during, during the Cuban Missile <coughs> Crisis was whatever the truth of its effect on world public opinion. And I'm actually fairly skeptical that it played a critical, a decisive role in terms of changing world public opinion about the situation in Cuba. But it became embedded in the American, in American political history as an example of effective public diplomacy. And fast forward to 2003, 2002, 2003, when the Bush administration is thinking about how to make its case on Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. And you know this has been reported by Bob Woodward and other people who've gotten into the kind of Bush administration deliberations. They wanted what they called an Adlai Stevenson moment. They wanted their moment in the Security Council where they could convince the rest of the world. And a lot of folks that I talked to in the administration, including John Negroponte, um, who was U.S. ambassador to the U.N., thought it was a strange, it was a strange choice to use the Security Council as the forum for Colin Powell's speech. They thought maybe, you know, why not give that speech to the World Affairs Council or to, you know, some venue. Um, in, in, you know, in Washington, um, you know, why give it to the Security Council? And I think it was because of that Adelaide Stevenson moment in part that they, they felt like this is where you make dramatic public presentations. Now, of course, the Bush administration ended up having the wrong Adelaide Stevenson moment. They had the Bay of Pigs moment instead of, uh, <laughs> instead of the Cuban Missile Crisis moment. Um, but th this notion of using the council to, to sway world opinion is very firmly embedded, I think, in, Amer in the American diplomatic psyche. Now, there's another strain um, in terms of how the council has been used that I also pick up on in the book, and that is the Security Council as a smoke-filled back room, um, which is what it, it sometimes has been, and increasingly, I would say, um, you know, certainly in the last 15 or 20 years, um, it, it has played this role more than it has played the role of a forum for very public uh, clashes, political clashes. The question of whether the Security Council should be fundamentally a place for debates in public or debates in private um, is something that goes back all the way back to the Security Council's founding. And one of the more interesting um, set of documents that I looked at for the book was the notes of the architects who designed the UN headquarters and who designed the Security Council chamber, they were very much alive to this question of, do we want this to be a forum for the public, in essence, where the public can see the world's leading statesmen debating issues of peace and security? Or do we want this to be a clubhouse for the big powers, where they can wrestle between themselves, hash out compromises, and maybe it's best in that clubhouse mode, that it not be in public. You know, maybe you want it to be behind the scenes. And so they actually debated this as they were designing the Security Council chamber that we that you see today if you go to New York. Um, and there was some very interesting back and forth between the diplomats about the shape of the table, for example. Um, they decided on. You, some of you will know that the table in the Security Council is a horseshoe-shaped table, um, and that was that was designed very purposefully. That. That way, the diplomats would be looking at each other. They wouldn't be looking out at the audience. They wouldn't be looking at the cameras. They would be looking at each other. They could engage e each other as diplomatic colleagues. Um, the decision, for example, to have the public gallery 
in the Security Council chamber, only on one side rather than kind of surrounding the table. That was a very conscious decision. Uh, some of the architects thought it would make it look too much like a circus if you had the public kind of all around um, the Security Council table. Instead, you have the public gallery on one side and you kind of have the windows facing the East River on the other side. Um, but the use of the, of the council as a back room, a smoke-filled room for the great powers to meet, is something that really accelerated in the late 1970s, actually. And it had to do, again, with some the architecture of the UN headquarters building. There was a, um, a series of uh, refurbishments that went on in the late 1970s. And they built what is called a consultation room, um, which is actually uh, only a few steps away from the formal Security Council chamber. And it's basically a tiny little conference room um, with a table that kind of mimics the formal table out in the formal uh, chamber. And that is where the Security Council actually nowadays does almost all of its work. It meets behind the scenes, behind closed doors, <coughs> in this consultation room. That's where the ambassadors hash out the resolutions, they debate issues. And they really only adjourn to the formal chamber once they've made a decision. So we've seen a, a change in how the Security Council is used from the 40s, 50s, 60s to the 70s and up to the present, where increasingly the work of the Security Council has gone behind closed doors um, and only emerging into the public when the, the Security Council members have reached a decision. Some of the ambassadors that I talked to, and I interviewed, I think, about 60 or 70 um, Security Council diplomats for this book, some of them thought this was a very good innovation. I talked to uh, Donald McHenry, who was the U.S. ambassador um, in the late 1970s. He told me a story about, he was one of the first ambassadors to work in this quiet consultation room. He told me a, a story about being in that consultation room and, you know, he had the Soviet ambassador on one side and I think he had on the other side of him another Soviet bloc ambassador. I think it may have been the Bulgarian ambassador. And as the meeting started in the consultation room, the Bulgarian ambassador launched into kind of a propaganda-laden speech about the evil imperialists, and everyone kind of sighs. Um, but the Soviet ambassador, who was a guy named Troyanovsky, um, leaned over to his Bulgarian fellow communists and said in perfect English, we don't talk that way in here. We don't talk that way in the consultation room. You can save those kind of speeches for the formal chamber. And that was the idea, in essence, of the consultation room, was this is a place where we don't have to put on airs. You know, we're not, there are no cameras here. We're just, we're just great powers trying to get along. Um, so that value, though, um, that, that use of the consultation room as a place to kind of hash things out um, in quiet is something that um, has emerged very much and, and has frustrated some people. I think some people up at, at the UN think the Security Council is doing too much behind the scenes now. That it needs to be more public, it needs to be more transparent about what it's doing. I'll talk about that a little bit more um, in a few moments. There have been wonderful personalities that have served on the Council over the years, and I document some of those personalities. Um, I'll just mention a couple of them. Uh, one of the earliest Soviet ambassadors was a guy named Andrei Vashinsky. Um, who had been one of the prosecutors during the Stalin show trials. Um, he used to go on hours-long denunciations of the West. There's a, a photo in the book of the American and Soviet amb ambassador, the American and British ambassadors kind of with their head in their hands as, as Vyshinsky is kind of thundering away at them. Um, so, you know, he was, a, he was a kind of notable ambassador and he had this kind of malignant aura about him because he'd been a prosecutor in the show trials. Everyone looking at him realized this is a guy who basically sentenced hundreds of people to death under the Stalin's regime. Gladwin Jeb um, was a British ambassador, and he was kind of the classic British ambassador, behind the scenes, very professional, diplomat, not very much in favor of using the, uh, the spotlight. Um, but during the Korean War, he became a public celebrity. Um, in large part because the American ambassador at that time was a guy named Warren Austin who is an old senator from Vermont, um, retired senator from Vermont, who was past his prime, to, be, to speak frankly, and wasn't really up for the, the, the rhetorical battles with the Soviets. And Gladwin Jeb, with his wonderful British accent, kind of emerged as the spokesman of the West during the Korean War debates. And a strange thing happened. I mean, he became, you know, fan mail from Americans started to pour into the British mission to the UN. 
people recognized him on the street. And apparently, poor Gladwin Jeb, it went to his head. And he would, would apparently, and then there are actually British diplomatic records about this, he would check his ratings on American television on a daily basis and would apparently become quite grumpy in the British mission when his ratings slipped against other celebrities. Um, and in the book, there's a wonderful cartoon from the New Yorker um, from the early 1950s kind of celebrating uh, Gladwin Jeb as this um, kind of passionate spokesman for, for the Western cause in Korea. Um, more recently, um, you know, jumping ahead to close to the present day, Sergei Lavrov, who is now Russian foreign minister, um, was the Russian ambassador to the Security Council for a number of years and was a phenomenally effective ambassador who really, I think a lot of Russians would point to him as one of the diplomats who kind of changed Russia, you know, in the middle 1990s from a country that was still reeling from the collapse of the Soviet Union, trying to figure out its place in the world, to a new, more assertive Russia uh, that was, you know, still a great power to be reckoned with. And Sergei Lavrov very much embodied that change in Russian diplomacy, and he very much um, has carried that through, you know, for those of you who follow Russian politics as foreign minister um, to this day. But one of the interesting stories about Lavrov that I tell in the book is that in addition to being, you know, fantastically smart and prepared, um, he was a fantastic um, caricaturist. And during the long Security Council meetings, and they often go on for a very long time, he would sit there, sit there with his head down, doodling. And suddenly, you know, after a little while, his colleagues realized that these were like gallery quality doodles. Um, and so what they would do, kind of sheepishly, the other ambassadors would start circulating behind his seat after the meeting and kind of picking up whatever scraps of paper he had left behind. And there's actually now something of a black market among Security Council diplomats of Sergei Lavrov doodles, um, which, you know, I don't know if that's in keeping with his image of, of the kind of hard-nosed Russian uh, negotiator, but I have one of the doodles reproduced um, in the book. Um, okay, so that's some of the public theater of the council, um, it, you know, the, the different roles that it's played and some of the personalities, and that's, you know, a large part of what I try to do in the book is, is tell that story. But I do have an argument that I make, um, a kind of argument based on the historical record of the Security Council about what the Council's utility is, what its role is um, in international affairs, how we should think about its value. And I actually think there are two different visions of the role that the Security Council should play. Um, and I think I might just kind of sketch those out for you. The first one, the first vision, is what I call the governance vision. And this vision, I think, you know, is very much the UN Charter vision, in a sense, of what the Security Council should do. Its job is to maintain international peace and security. Um, and for the founders of the UN, that meant, I think, you know, foremost in their minds was stopping any new outbreak of aggression. You know, making sure there was no repeat of German and Japanese and Italian aggression. Um, but in our, you know, to our minds nowadays, Maintaining international peace and security means so much more than that. It means stopping nuclear proliferation. It means stopping crimes against humanity and genocide. It means um, you know, dealing with piracy off the Somali coast. There are just, you know, stopping terrorist financing. All of these things are part of maintaining international peace and security. And I think the, when people think about the Security Council and how it's performing and how effective it is, I think this is the idea they have in their mind, that the Security Council should go out and solve problems. It should solve Darfur. It should solve Congo. Um, it should stop Iran and North Korea from getting nuclear weapons. Okay? So in a very rudimentary sense, it should be a kind of world government. I don't mean a world government in the sense that you know, it takes away the, all the powers from national governments, but it should govern. It should be a world police force that governs security around the world. Um, now, this governance vision, how does the council stack up when this is your vision of what the Security Council should do? I think it stacks up very poorly, very poorly. It's very hard to say that it's anything but a failure when it comes to these missions. Um, you know, on its watch, states have acquired nuclear weapons. I see little sign that the council will be able to stop Iran from going nuclear if it wants to. Uh, it certainly didn't stop North Korea. Um, it has been 
intermittent and largely ineffective in combating genocide, crimes against humanity. Um, I traveled with the Security Council to Darfur and to Congo, and it doesn't take very long being on the ground there to realize how short-staffed the peacekeeping forces are, how inadequate their resources are to dealing with uh, the situations that they're confronting. And I talk in the book about kind of the most horrific example of the Security Council's failure um, when it comes to atrocities. And that was kind of the, the, the horrible years of 1994 and 1995 when on the Security Council's watch, with peacekeepers on the ground, you had first the genocide in Rwanda, with the Security Council totally incapable of responding effectively to it, in fact, scaling down the peacekeeping force that it had there, instead of intervening effectively. And then almost exactly a year later, you had the massacre in, in uh, Srebrenica in Bosnia, where again, peacekeepers on the ground, um, the council meets, dithers, is totally unable to stop the worst massacre in Europe since World War II, 8,000 Bosnian uh, men and boys killed. Um, so, given its record, I think it's hard to conclude that the council is anything but a failure as a governance mechanism. That, I think, is where, the, for most people, the analysis stops. Um, and that is why, I think, the UN is often held in fairly low regard um, particularly as it relates to these questions. I think people are more generous when it comes to the UN's kind of role in refugees and humanitarian aid and development and that kind of thing. But on the key questions of peace and security, it has a very, very um, spotty record. But there's another vision out there uh, that I try to sketch out in the book of what the Security Council does and what it can do. And that I call the concert vision. Um, and the notion of the concert vision is very different. It asks not so much how effectively has the Security Council dealt with all these problems out there. Instead it asks, what is the effect that the Security Council has on relations between its permanent members? Um, how does it affect U.S.-Russian relations that the United States and Russia serve together on the Security Council and are constantly negotiating with each other about Security Council decisions? How does it affect British-French relations, that they work together on the Security Council? How does it affect U.S.-China relations? Um, so the, the concert vision asks, how effective has the Security Council been as a mechanism for helping the great powers to manage their own relations with each other? It's a vision that's less focused on all these external problems out there and more focused on how the Council has helped the great powers to get along to manage their own relations. There, I think, looking at the historical record of the council, um, the record is somewhat more positive. And I want to sketch out uh, just a couple of the ways in which I think that's true. First of all, and at a very basic level, the Security Council ensures that the, great, the major powers are in contact with each other all the time on all sorts of different issues. This is not a small accomplishment. Um, and there have been plenty of periods in world history where the great powers haven't been talking to each other, um, where they've constantly surprised each other, um, or they've miscommunicated. On a daily basis, you have high-level representatives of the US, China, Russia, France, and Britain sitting down together and hashing out issues. That, I think, is a very positive thing. I went back and I looked, um, I went back and I tabulated where US secretaries of state have traveled since 1990. My thought was, let me kind of check whether, you know, they've traveled more to uh, Security Council members than to the territories of other countries. And so I said, but to be fair, let me compare the four other permanent members of the Security Council with four other major powers. So I put um, India, Germany, Japan, um, and Brazil, I think as you know, four major powers who occasionally serve on the Security Council but aren't there permanently. It turns out that the, United, the U.S. Secretaries of State have traveled twice as often to the countries that are other members of the Permanent Five than to these other four big powers. Now, is that definitive evidence you know, uh, from an academic standpoint? No, definitely not. But it's suggestive that what the Security Council does is kind of deepen the contacts between the big powers that serve together on the Council. Um, the Council has provided a quiet space where the great powers can reach compromise. 
And I would here point actually to an incident early in the Security Council's history, the Berlin blockade of 1948, a very, very dangerous moment in U.S.-Soviet um, US relations, Soviet-Western relations, really, where there was a real possibility of conflict. Um, it was resolved at a diplomatic level through a quiet conversation outside of the Security Council chamber between the U.S. ambassador, a guy named Philip Jessup, and the Soviet ambassador. Um, they met once outside the Security Council chamber. They followed up a month later, had a series of meetings up in New York that the State Department and the, and the uh, Soviet Foreign Ministry used as the mechanism for negotiating the end to the Berlin blockade. Now, that's not a formal action by the Security Council. That's no, there was no resolution passed. There was no formal decision taken. But it was a very important, informal way of the Security Council helping the great powers find a space where they could negotiate their way out of a dangerous crisis. Um, the Security Council has also been an important delay mechanism. It has often strung out issues, um, and actually doing that can be itself an important contribution to relations between the big powers. Here, I would point to the Cuban Missile Crisis, actually. Um, and if you read um, the assessment of Dean Rusk, who was the U.S. Secretary of State during the Cuban Missile Crisis, he says that the overwhelming value of the UN, and he thinks it was a remarkable value, was that it slowed the pace of events. By having a, a, a series of Security Council meetings over a week, um, you know, where in essence everyone could take a breath during the Council meetings. They would go on for hours and hours and hours. Everything would have to be translated. Um, Rusk says that he thinks this you know, effectively slowed the pace of events and made it less likely that one of the sides would make a rash decision. Um, and I think you can see that the, the value of the Security Council in slowing the pace of events um, quite often in its history. Now, that slowing of events is, of course, deeply frustrating to anyone who has the governance vision of the Council in mind. You know, um, if you're thinking, how do we respond to Rwanda? How do we respond to Darfur? You want action, and you want it now. Uh, Security Council doesn't do that well. It does not do things quickly. It doesn't take quick action, except in very unusual circumstances. But slowing the pace of events can be very useful for the big powers as they're trying to kind of navigate their way through a crisis. Um, so that, that, I think, is an important, what I would call a concert benefit. And finally, the, the kind of last one that I'll um, mention is that, quite simply, it ingrains in great power diplomacy the habit of compromise. Because what are they doing up in New York every day when they meet in the Security Council? They are compromising over texts. They're compromising over resolutions. They're, you know, the Americans are saying, well, we'd really like this in a resolution on Congo. And, and the Russians say no. Or the Chinese say, well, we have to water it down this way. Um, and it, it, it basically instills in generations of diplomats the habit of compromise with you know, some of the other major powers out there. And so a lot of these ambassadors who serve on the council go on to become national security advisors. Uh, there was a, a French ambassador who went on to become basically the national security advisor in France. Um, Alan Albright went on to become secretary of state. Sergei Lavrov, I've mentioned. Um, George H.W. Bush, who's a US ambassador, who went on to become president. So these are important diplomats up there who are learning on a day-to-day -day basis through kind of mind-numbing repetition the habit of compromise between the big powers. And I don't think, it's a hard thing to kind of say, you know, to look back at the historical record and see, ah, here's the result of that. But I would, I would like to suggest that that is an important practice, an important habit that the Security Council helps to instill. Okay, I've, I've taxed your patience here. Let me just give you a couple of um, implications of my view of the Security Council, this view that the concert benefit may significantly outweigh the governance benefit. Because I think it leads to some um, perhaps somewhat counterintuitive conclusions. First of all, on the question of Security Council reform or Security Council expansion, which is, for anyone who follows UN affairs, this is kind of the, the issue that will never die at the UN. Um, and for those of you who might have listened to the speeches in the General Assembly um, last week or the week before, almost every head of state talked about the need for Security Council reform. From the eccentric, like Muammar Gaddafi, who I believe called the Security Council a terror council, 
um, to Brazil's President Lula da Silva, who you know thundered on about how the Security Council needs to be reformed to kind of be updated to the modern world. Um, so, you know, if we if we agree that the Council is better in this concert mode than as a, a governance mechanism, what does that say about Security Council expansion? My view is that it says we should be cautious. We should be cautious about expanding the Security Council because. One of the main arguments for expanding it is, well, it has to be legitimate to the rest of the world. It has to be legitimate, it has to be representative. Well, that's something that you care about most if you're thinking about the Security Council as a governance mechanism. If you're just thinking about it as a clubhouse for the great powers where they help to negotiate their own differences, that legitimacy, that representativeness is, some, is somewhat less important, I would say. Moreover, there's the danger that if you reform the Security Council and expand it up to 25 or 30 members, which is what many of the um, proposals for Security Council reform would involve, that then you're going to lose this benefit of it being a conducive place for big power plungs. Because, you know, how effective is the General Assembly as a mechanism for diplomacy? Not very. You know, at 30 members, I, I'm concerned that the Security Council might be simply too large, too unwieldy to play this concert role that I identify. So that's one uh, possible implication. A second is that we should not be displeased when the council does things behind the scenes. There's been this movement in New York to demand that the council be transparent. More public meetings. More public meetings, notes should be published, you know, transcripts of private meetings should be made public. Um, and I'm skeptical that that's a good thing, because you, you want the Security Council to be able to operate behind closed doors. You want ambassadors to be able to say things that they wouldn't say in public, um, to try out ideas without being you know, publicly hold, held to them. You want that, that space for kind of diplomatic maneuver. And so I think the private meetings of the Security Council are something important, something that should be defended. Finally. There's the kind of question about, should we think of the Security Council as a political body or as a legal body? Because it is both. I mean, it, it's a political body, clearly. Um, you know, its decisions are political compromises between its members. But it's also a legal body. It also is, in many respects, and it's often treated as the final arbiter of international legality. The Iraq War was illegal, said Kofi Annan. Why? Because there was no Security Council approval. Um, well, okay, that's, I mean, I, from an international law perspective, I think that's true. But should we, in thinking about the Security Council, think of it as a legal kind of governing body, or should we think of it as a political concert? And I say it's most important to think of it as a political concert um, rather than as some kind of legal arbiter. Those, I think, I think I'll just leave it there in terms of my, you know, implications, the implications of this view that I put forward for the Security Council's future, I would maybe in closing just say that one of the frustrating things to my mind about debates about the UN, particularly in the United States, um, is that two camps tend to form. You've got the one camp which says this body is useless, worse than useless, counterproductive, corrupt, um, bureaucratic, there's nothing good that can come out of it. And that is a very powerful view in the United States. Um, and then on the other hand, you have kind of the UN idealist view that, that says anything that is done in terms of the use of force that does not have Security Council approval is illegal and illegitimate. And you saw this argument made often during the Iraq War. It was kind of quieter during the Kosovo conflict when we also bypassed the Security Council. Um, but but during the Iraq War, you know, why was the U.S. wrong? The U.S. was wrong because it bypassed the U.N. Now, the U.S. may have been wrong, but I don't think it was wrong because it bypassed the U.N. Um, I think there are, there are other issues there. Um, and we shouldn't kind of put the U.N., we shouldn't kind of push it into this mode of kind of being the end-all and be-all in terms of legitimacy in international relations. My frustration is that if you're debating the U.N. in the United States, you kind of have to pick one of those camps. You know, there, there's not a whole lot of middle ground. And I guess what I'm trying to stake out in this book is a passionate middle ground for the real political value of this institution, the Security Council. And yet I hope 
uh, a realistic understanding of what its limitations are as we go about grappling with the really serious security problems that there are um, around the world. So I will leave it there, and I, um, but I would love to, to take questions and engage in, uh, in dialogue with you. So thank you. Yes? I have a question. Uh, when I was young, uh, older than many people in the room here, I seem to remember that there was this huge debate that went on when communist China, the Chinese People's Republic, took over China of which one was going to be on the Security Council. Yes. How was that ever settled? I forget. Uh, very good. I'm, I actually spend quite a bit of time talking about that in the book. Um, one of the oddities in the Security Council's history, and I'm very glad you brought this up, is that for much of the Council's history, from you know the late 1940s um, up to 1971, the China seat that Roosevelt had so passionately fought for was held by Taiwan, was the representative of China. And the, the American position was that you know the nationalist government that fled to Taiwan in the late 1940s of Chiang Kai-shek, that was the legitimate government of China. And the United States, every year, the U.S. State Department would, would go into hyperdrive because some communist country would propose a resolution at the U.N. saying, this is absurd, can we please unseat Taipei and have communist China take the China Sea? You know, one of the, the, the dilemmas of this debate was that both Taiwan, of course, and mainland China said there was only one China. So if you had to choose, it was one of the two. Nobody, none, neither of them were willing to say there will be two seats. Okay, so it had to be one seat. So this, this went on for years and years. And the U.S. would kind of corral its allies and threaten, you know, coerce and cajole people into voting with them. And they managed to succeed on this vote in the U.N. every year until the Nixon-Kissinger diplomacy basically finally helped put an end to that um, with the United States basically had for, you know, forming diplomatic relations with mainland China. Um, and at that point, there was a vote held um, in the General Assembly, and Taiwan lost that vote. Um, and so at that moment, talk about a bad day, at that moment, Taiwan lost Security Council seat, it lost all represent, you know, powers of the UN, it was a non-entity of the UN as soon as that vote took place. Communist China comes in, their delegation arrives in New York in November 71, I believe, um, and they become the new face of China on the Security Council and at the UN. Um, Interestingly, the Soviets, of course, had been pushing for Communist China to have a seat for a long time. Uh, that was, in fact, what they had walked out about during the Korean War. When they walked out, they walked out because of the U.S. position on China. But by the time China, this was kind of the, the American revenge, by the time China got on the Security Council, China had become a, an enemy of the Soviet Union. You know, the Soviet, Sino-Soviet Sino relations in the early, late 1960s, early 70s were horrible. Um, and when, in fact, the new Chinese ambassador, uh, Huang Hua, arrived to um, kind of meet his Security Council colleagues, George H.W. Bush was actually the U.S. ambassador, and he tells this story in his autobiography of being at this reception where the Chinese ambassador, the new communist Chinese ambassador, is brought in. He refuses to shake hands with the Soviet ambassador. The Soviet ambassador turns, you know, crimson. Um, you know, it's a huge diplomatic um, kind of rebuff. And one of the fascinating things, reading the transcripts of the Security Council debates, which I did quite a lot of, um, was that there were unbelievable clashes between the Soviets and the Chinese in the, in those, in the early 1970s. Um, and I have in the, in the book almost a, a picture of a near fistfight that broke out between the Chinese ambassador and the Soviet ambassador during the 1973 war. So China got on the Security Council finally, um, not, I think, in the way that the Soviet Union would have liked. They came on really as an enemy of the Soviet Union and sometimes a kind of tactical ally of the United States. So a very interesting uh, aspect of the Security Council's history. Yes, sir. Yeah, you said that um, they, that 